Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and back there is my assistant Julie Oliver. Anti-vaxxers have been doing their best to convince people not to get vaccinated since the pandemic began. First they tried to deny the severity of the disease. When that didn't work they turned their hand to claiming that effective treatments were available. First cab off the rank was hydroxychloroquine. When the large-scale trial showed hydroxychloroquine didn't work they turned their attention to ivermectin, claiming it was a miracle cure which meant vaccines weren't necessary. And they were aided in their endeavours by grifters and people who don't understand science making the same nonsense claims. Well, we now know that the trials showing ivermectin's miraculous properties were fraudulent and the better designed trials are showing it has no effect. And although Pierre Corey and co are doing their best to keep up the hype on ivermectin with more dodgy trials, interest in ivermectin is waning. Indeed, Google search trends show that ivermectin searches are way down on their peak. Of course, if you are still interested in learning why the science doesn't support ivermectin, I've made four videos about it. So what's an anti-vaxxer to do? Enter Omicron. And we're back to the start with people claiming that Omicron is so mild we don't need to worry about it. And we should just let it rip with some even going so far as to suggest it's like an attenuated virus vaccine and that we should all aim to be infected so that we have protection against further disease. Hmm, getting sick so you are protected against getting sick. Interesting logic. Omicron minimizers like to point to the lower rates of hospitalization versus Delta as evidence of why we shouldn't be worried. But as of Ivermectin fans, they are ignoring the confounders. Firstly, Omicron is occurring when there is a much higher rate of previous infection and vaccination than when Delta hit. The key point of vaccines is to prevent serious disease, so it's not surprising that as vaccination increases, hospitalisation rates will decrease. Similarly, people who were infected in previous waves also have some degree of protection against serious disease. And of course, they also have survivorship bias. Those who didn't survive previous waves are no longer around. And just to show you how effective vaccines are at preventing serious disease, this chart shows a proportion of people in the UK requiring critical care by vaccination status and age. As you can see, in every age group, the proportion of people requiring critical care is substantially lower for those who have been vaccinated and even lower still for those who have had a third dose. Now, the data that I've just shown you is from May to December 2021, so it will be primarily pre-Omicron. But the UK HSA has also specifically looked at the effect of three vaccine doses on hospitalisations in those over 65. And these are the results. Firstly, they looked at the odds ratio against symptomatic disease. And an odds ratio of one means no improvement compared to symptomatic disease. So two to nine weeks after the third dose, there's a 49% reduction in symptomatic cases compared with being unvaccinated. And this drops to 38% after 10 weeks post-dose. In comparison, protection against symptomatic disease with Delta remains well above 80% even after 10 weeks. And this is, of course, exactly what we would expect because we know Omicron is able to escape some antibodies. Things get much better though when we look at the hazard ratio against hospitalisation. For those who are infected, people who have received three doses of vaccine are 89% protected against hospitalisation compared with the unvaccinated two to nine weeks after receiving their third dose and 85% after 10 weeks. And again, this is what we would expect because we know that T cell epitopes are largely preserved in Omicron. And if you want to know more about this, I cover it in my Omicron science versus wishful thinking video. The final column in the table is vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization. And this is determined by combining the effectiveness against symptomatic infection with effectiveness against hospitalization in those who are infected. And we find overall that there is a 95% vaccine efficacy against hospitalization two to nine weeks after the third dose and 89% after 10 weeks, which is 
pretty good. So essentially what we are seeing is that Omicron's ability to escape antibodies but not T-cells means that those who are either vaccinated or previously infected are more likely to catch Omicron than previous variants, but less likely to get serious disease. When we correct the hospitalisation figures for previous infections, as was done in this report by Imperial College London, we see that there is only a 24% reduction in hospitalisation amongst the unvaccinated for Omicron compared with Delta. Now, that is certainly better than an increase, but it is important to remember that Delta already had a higher hospitalisation rate than the Alpha variant, and Alpha already had a higher hospitalisation rate than the wild type variant. So while it's possible that Omicron is slightly less virulent, we shouldn't confuse mildness as a result of vaccination with mildness of the variant. And this is particularly important amongst age groups with lower vaccination rates like children. In many countries, vaccination rates are much lower amongst younger children. There are no vaccines approved anywhere in the world for under fives, and even amongst over fives, vaccination rates are much lower amongst children compared with adults. And these lower rates are a combination of vaccine hesitancy and lack of access. In Australia, for example, children five to 12 have only just become eligible for vaccination. So let's switch countries now and look at some recent data on children's hospitalizations from New York. This figure shows the increasing hospitalizations week on week through December 2021, stratified by age. As you can see, the rate of increase in hospitalizations for children is much higher than the rate of increase for older age groups. If you look at the bottom line, the increases in cases since the week of December 5 is 791% for children aged 0 to 4 years, 335% for children aged 5 to 12, and 1,047% for those aged 12 to 18. In contrast, the increase is 241% for adults aged 19 to 64 years, and 187% for adults over 65. Still substantial increases, but much lower than for children. Now, another argument used by Omicron fans to downplay Omicron's severity is to point out that not everyone who is in hospital with Omicron is in hospital because they have Omicron, and in some cases it is just an incidental finding. Now, this is certainly true, but it has always been the case, and it ignores the fact that testing positive for COVID can negatively impact your prognosis with other conditions. As an example, this is a meta-analysis looking at the effect of COVID on mortality of patients requiring surgery for hip fractures. It included 10 studies, and this forest plot summarises the findings. All studies showed that mortality following hip fracture surgery was increased if patients were COVID positive. And when the results were combined, it showed that patients were 4.68 times more likely to die following hip fracture surgery if they tested COVID positive compared with testing COVID negative. So incidental COVID findings in hospital patients shouldn't be dismissed as inconsequential. A mistake we've previously discussed regarding our ivermectin fans is their failure to understand the limitations of preclinical research and their general inability to understand scientific papers. Needless to say, we are seeing exactly the same mistakes with Omicron minimizers. Omicron fans are getting very excited about studies in mice and hamsters showing milder disease with Omicron than other variants and claiming this is evidence that Omicron will cause mild disease in people. It's not. There is a saying in medical science, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. Studies showing that mice and hamsters have milder disease with Omicron show that mice and hamsters have milder disease with Omicron. Nothing more, nothing less. And if you read the actual studies, you will see that the authors don't overstate their findings like those promoting their studies do. The other thing getting Omicron minimizers excited is the in vitro and ex vivo research suggesting that the Omicron variant is less likely to infect lung cells than the Delta variant. 
And this is a preprint from a group of authors from various universities and institutions in the UK. And I've got to say that their research is seriously cool. They looked at various aspects of the virus, but one of the most interesting findings was that Omicron appears to have switched to favour a different cell entry mechanism. Now, there are two ways SARS-CoV-2 and related coronaviruses can enter cells. Both ways initially rely on binding to ACE2, but use different mechanisms after that. The first route is called cell surface fusion, which is mediated by Tempres2. And the second route is fusion from the endosome after endocytosis. And don't worry if you don't really understand the mechanisms. It's not really important. What is important is that different cells in the body favour entry by different mechanisms depending on their level of Tempus 2 expression. And don't worry if you don't know what Tempus 2 is either. It's not that important for what we're going to talk about next. So this figure shows the level of infection by pseudotype viruses for different cell lines. The first cell line is a lung cell line that expresses Tempus 2 and as you can see Delta has a higher level of infection than Omicron and it is about fourfold higher because it is a log scale. The other variants however don't have a higher level of infection than Omicron and they were no walk in the park. And pangolin CoV is a coronavirus that only uses the non temperous route of entry. The next cell line is a kidney cell line and this doesn't express Tempus 2. And in this case, Omicron produces about a tenfold greater signal than Delta. So although based on this in vitro research, Omicron may be less likely to infect the lungs, it may be more likely to infect cells in organs that express less Tempus 2. And this is important because serious COVID isn't just a disease of the lungs. SARS-CoV-2 can also infect many other organs, including the heart, the brain, the liver and the kidneys and cause serious damage in all those organs. So which organs in the body have cells that express less tempus 2? Let's find out. Lucky for us, researchers have prepared a review paper looking at COVID damage beyond the lungs. That just happens to answer this question and here it is. The paper includes these helpful figures which show ACE2 and tempus 2 dis distribution throughout the body. The darker the colour, the higher the expression. The figure with the blue colour coding is for Tempus 2. And as you can see, the heart, the brain, the kidneys and the liver all have lower expression of Tempus 2 than the lungs, whilst having higher expression of ACE2, which can be seen in the figure with the pink and red colour coding. This means that these organs could potentially be more susceptible to infection by Omicron, which favours the non tempus 2 route. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that Omicron is more likely to lead to damage in organs with lower tempus 2 expression. The human body is far more complicated than what occurs in in vitro research. And at this stage, the research isn't even peer reviewed. What I am saying, though, is you can't choose results from in vitro research that support your argument without considering other potential implications of the research. And the other elephant in the room is long COVID. We know that many people continue to suffer debilitating symptoms several months to two years so far after having COVID, particularly if they were unvaccinated, and that this can occur even if their initial illness was mild. And we just don't know yet what the incidence of long COVID will be with Omicron. So in summary, Omicron fans are making the same science mistakes as ivermectin fans. And whilst it's possible that Omicron is slightly less virulent than Delta, we shouldn't draw conclusions from non-peer-reviewed preclinical studies. And we shouldn't confuse mildness as a result of vaccination with mildness of the variant. And finally, even if Omicron turns out to be less virulent, we shouldn't confuse lower severity with no severity. People are being hospitalised with Omicron and people are dying, particularly the unvaccinated. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. 
Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that more people will see it. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.